Well, hi, everybody. In this video, I'd like to give you a brief introduction to the topic of abstract algebra and a little bit about the sorts of things that you're going to find in a course about abstract algebra. Now, algebra itself is a very broad subject. As you may know, there's a whole branch of mathematics called linear algebra. And in fact, many universities have courses devoted specifically to linear algebra. In a course like linear algebra, you get generally a first exposure to what's called an abstract algebraic structure. An abstract algebraic structure is something that's maybe a little less familiar than the real numbers or the integers or the whole numbers that we grew up learning about, but which often has very important real world applications. In a linear algebra course, you typically are learning about vector spaces. A vector space is a great example of an abstract algebraic structure. In fact, it's often the first one that students of mathematics are exposed to. In a course like abstract algebra, what we're going to try and do is learn about some other types of abstract algebraic structures. And the ones that most typically get associated with this course would be something called a group. So I'll say groups. And then related to that is the concept of a ring. And related to that is the concept of a field. So in a nutshell, abstract algebra studies groups, rings, and fields. These are all abstract algebraic structures. These are examples of abstract algebraic structures. Of course, in the real world, we mostly work with, you know, in your familiar experience of of math, say in calculus or differential equations or something like that, you were working mostly with real numbers, right? So real numbers, uh, which of course includes things like, uh, so, so this would be the real numbers. It's a good chance for me to share a little notation too. Uh, so the real numbers is a very familiar algebraic structure. Um, you may have worked inside of the real numbers with just the whole numbers, which are generally called the integers and written with a, a script Z. So these are actually examples of algebraic structures. You've seen algebraic structures before, of course. But what we've come to realize in our understanding of the world is that there are other types of algebraic structures that are also very important. And they come under the, these types of headings, groups, rings, and fields. They maybe don't have the same structural rules that the real numbers have or that the integers have. There's more general requirements for something to be an abstract algebraic structure. Once you sort of take that broader perspective and you make a definition of a group, for example, right? Then you're going to find that there are many examples of groups, not just things that are familiar from our uh, lower division math courses, but there are other structures, mathematical structures that are actually important in the real world, right? For example, group theory. One example of a group is to take the collection of all possible rotations and reflections of some three-dimensional object. Well, this has applications in physics and chemistry, the sciences, of course. It's a very, very important example of a group. Um, group theory is also really important in computer science. Uh, there are many examples of structures where um, efficiency of computer programs can be uh, understood through the lens of abstract algebra. So there are a lot of places where these abstract algebraic structures show up in the real world. And that's why we study them. That's why it's important that a person with a mathematics background has some exposure to 
uh, these topics. So in an abstract algebra course, like the one that I often teach, we spend a lot of time studying the properties and examples of groups, rings, and fields, as well as their applications in the real world. So we'll be doing a lot of that. Um, let me take in this video just a few minutes to give a specific example of something for which abstract algebra plays a really important role. Um, so let me just call this a, a, a fundamental example. This is just to kind of get you motivated, <laughs> to get you a little bit inspired about abstract algebra, because it is abstract. It's not something that everybody thinks about every day. But one example of an important application that finds its um, underpinnings in algebra is finding roots. This is something you maybe have thought about before. Finding roots of polynomials. Okay? It's a very, very important thing to be able to do to solve a polynomial, to find its roots. And it turns out that a lot of what's mentioned on this board in terms of these abstract algebraic structures is very important in the background on this particular topic. Let me give you uh, a couple of examples about finding roots of polynomials. You know, a classic example of a polynomial might be this quadratic polynomial right here. AX squared plus BX plus C. And just to make sure that this is a quadratic polynomial, I'm going to make sure that the leading coefficient, which is A, is not zero. And of course, you might ordinarily be thinking of A, B, and C as being like real numbers, for example, but they don't actually have to be real numbers. Um, that the, the scalars just have to belong to a field. Notice I talk here about a field, and we'll review what a field is um, you know, at another time. But basically, you have some field of scalars, right? So F, capital F, is a field where the scalars or our polynomials are going to live, okay? And of course, one thing that I'm sure everybody knows is how to get the roots of a quadratic polynomial. This is often recited in a high school algebra class. So the solutions for X, as you know, they would be negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. I should mention that our field of scalars has to have a nice property that, um, you know, the A is not going to be zero. This, this denominator cannot be zero. So, uh, you know, we've assumed here that A is, is not zero. Uh, this formula for the roots of this quadratic equation, that this is normally derived. This is derived by completing the square. So by completing the square, we can derive the roots of a quadratic equation. Okay. To take it a step further, we can also look at polynomials that have higher degree. So we could be looking at, uh, you know, for example, a cubic polynomial, ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d. Or maybe at the same time, I'll mention a quartic polynomial, which is a fourth degree polynomial, which might look something like this. Okay, and in, in both cases, again, I would assume that A is not zero. It turns out that even for a quartic or cubic polynomial, as I've mentioned here, it's possible to write down a formula for the roots of such a polynomial. So formulas have actually been developed. They're just not as simple as the quadratic formula that we uh, have in the box here. So uh, formulas for the roots here, formulas for the roots uh, were derived. They're not nice formulas, by the way. They're messy, okay? 
but the roots uh, have formulas that were derived by the 1500s. So this has been around for a long time. Uh, and you can actually solve a cubic or a quart, uh, sorry, a cubic or a quartic equation and find the roots using the formulas that have been uh, derived. Now, what's kind of interesting, I'm not going to write down those formulas, as I said, that they are they are kind of complicated. But what is very interesting, actually, is that if we go to polynomials of fifth degree or higher, so I'll use this as my third point here, a mathematician named Abel, A-B-E-L, Abel is a mathematician, he proved in the 1800s, he proved in the 1800s that there is no formula there is no formula for the roots of a polynomial of degree five or more. No formula for the roots um, that works uh, for polynomials of degree I'll use n for the degree. If the degree of our polynomial is five or more, there is no one size fits all formula to find the roots of that polynomial. So this is actually something that is proven using abstract algebra. Basically the way it works, I'm not going to prove this result right now, but what we can do, the sort of the idea behind this is that to each polynomial, let me call it P of X, which is some polynomial in, I'll write this as F of X. This is just the sort of the, it's the ring, if you will, of all polynomials with coefficients in the scalar field F. And to each polynomial that we can write down, we associate, we are going to associate a group. We are going to associate a group. It's called the Galois group. So G-A-L, let me give myself a little more room here. It's the Galois group. This is one of the things that, would be studied in an abstract algebra course. It's the Galois group of K over F. And let me explain what I mean by that, right? Where K, what is this K that I've written down here? K is a field. So again, we're looking at a field that contains, so it's a field containing the original field of scalars capital F and all roots of the polynomial itself. So we can take our polynomial P of X. It has some roots, all right? We can take those roots together with the base field, capital F, and build a larger field. And that's called capital K. And Interesting, there's a connection between field theory and group theory. This is one of the powerful ideas that we often study in abstract algebra. That connection is uh, made by associating this Galois group to the polynomial. Just as an example, just give you one quick example here of this. Let's suppose that my base field of scalars is the real numbers. And let's just pick a really nice polynomial, P of X, let's say X squared plus one. Okay. Now, in this case, in this case, we probably know what the roots are because we can use the quadratic formula to get them. Uh, the roots, R plus and minus I. 
the imaginary number i, right? Well, so in this case, the field, the capital K field, what is it? It's the field containing the original base field of scalars, that's the real numbers, and all of the roots of the polynomial, which are plus and minus i. If you want to have a field that contains the real numbers and contains plus or minus i, then you're really talking about, okay, so anything of this form, right? You're going to have plus and minus i with potentially some real numbers in front of those. So this would be such that a and b are real numbers. And that, my friends, is actually the field of complex numbers. So this is a very important example of a field. It's the complex numbers. And it turns out that the Galois group, I'm going to put the real numbers on the bottom and the complex. So this is the notation here, right? The Galois group of the complex numbers over the real numbers, it turns out it's going to be familiar to a very simple group, which is just Z2, which is really just the numbers 0 and 1 in mod 2 under addition. Okay, that forms a group, and it's a group of size two, um, which is kind of interesting because this, this uh, complex number set turns out to be a two-dimensional vector space. If I think of the dimension of the complex numbers as a vector space over the real numbers, it's two-dimensional. And the basis... If something is two-dimensional, it means that it has a basis of two things, right? The basis is just simply one and i. Everything in the complex numbers is sort of a linear combination of one and i. So it's very interesting that we can associate a group to sort of a, an extension of fields. So here in this case, the complex numbers as an extension of the real numbers. And so we're going to be studying this in an abstract algebra course in much more detail. And it's through the use of tools like this, the Galois groups, the field extensions, it's through that study that we can actually get some better insight into the statement that I've got up here at the top of the board, which is that there are no formulas for the roots of polynomials that have degree five or more. It's kind of a theoretical application of abstract algebra. Of course, abstract algebra also has many much more tangible applications. As I mentioned, chemistry, physics, um, even the security of credit card information that you put on the internet has a lot of abstract algebra behind it. That's where there's the whole theory of cryptography and secret codes. I hope that this has given you just a brief glimpse of little inspiration to want to know more about how abstract algebra and these algebraic structures that we're going to learn about, groups, rings, and fields, play an important role in our real world, as well as in, in inspiring our curiosity about how math works on a more abstract playing field. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this introductory video. I hope it's been inspiring and helpful, and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Bye for now.